Today we are interviewing Mr. Adrian Long. Uh, he's a businessman uh, into fishing. Uh, he's, he's one of the uh, businessmen who has partnered with Fishco in a company that has uh, been in the news lately. So today we are interviewing Mr. Long to explain his side of the story because we have written about him for several uh, years, but today for the first time he will be explaining to us uh, his business. Mr. Lowe, um, can you just uh, briefly tell us about yourself and your business interest? Good morning, Shinewene, and thank you very much for the opportunity to shed some light on uh, our business and our investment in Namibia. I'm a Namibian businessman, uh, a farmer and a family man. I own some farms in the south of Namibia where we started a date project. Uh, I started about 30 years ago in Angola as a businessman, uh, entrepreneur, uh, worked as an economist for the Angolan State Diamond Board, and then we started our fishing activity about 25 years ago, where we acquired one factory, and slowly, slowly we built our way up from the bottom to the top where we own today eight factories in Angola. We own this factory in uh, Valvish Bay. 60% uh, thereof, and then we also own 100% of a factory in Mossel Bay called Afro Fishing, which is a big cannery that we are expanding at the moment. So in short, uh, that is a short description of my activity over the last few years. Yes, sir. Perfect. Thank you. Um, you partnered with Fishco in setting up a company called Seaflower Pelagic Factory. Uh, this partnership has been, you know, linked to controversy, to the controversial Fishco uh, fish rod scandal, uh, but before we go to that, how did your involvement in this partnership start? Can you take us through from the first day? Uh, my business partner, Johan Breed, was approached by a South African Investec portfolio manager in the third quarter of 2016, and he was asked if AST Angola would be interested to meet with Fishco from Namibia. Fishco had plans to build a land-based pelagic fishing plant, and according to the information, they were looking for business partners that understood the risk and had the necessary expertise. Fishco also did not have the required capital to fund such an endeavor. We were informed that the local Namibian business were already approached and had declined the proposed project. We have had set up a meeting and site visit at our plants in Angola. I was introduced to James Atukulipi and Mike Ngapinya during this trip. I took them through our land-based pelagic plant and they were very impressed. We employ 1,800 Angolan workers and that was very important to them. I must add that we vetted James and Mike before they were invited and both gentlemen had prominent positions. James was the head of Investec Namibia and clearly trusted. Explaining that, um, can you kindly, because one of the key concerns is that you were handpicked to partner with Fishco. How do you feel that this, this whole partnership was not even advertised publicly? That means it was just a decision by several individuals to pick you or to go to Angola and just say, okay, we want to par partner with Mr. Lowe. This is not cor correct, uh, Shinomeni. Um, the facts of this matter is that we only came in on the scene in 2016, at the end of 2016. This very same project was offered to three other companies, two companies in Namibia, one foreign company, and we were number four on the list. The first two Namibian companies uh, that have been very active in the horse mackerel industry for the last 30 years, made big money out of it. Um, they were asked by the ministry to invest in a similar project, which of course they declined. So if you think about it, um, it, you know, it was advertised in the government gazette. The government made this decision that they want to go on this route. And then there was three companies in front of us, and not, not one of them, took the bait. So eventually then, at the end of 2016, um, we were introduced to, to Fishco, and then when we were presented with the facts, which at the time was that there wasn't already a governmental, uh, government gazettes in place, the 50,000 was already in place. I mean, we, we did not come up with the 50,000 number. They had feasibility studies and done in 2015, 14, to achieve what, what amount of quota do you need to achieve making a small profit on our land infrastructure. So if you put all these things, the land for instance, the, 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 the famous Itali transaction was done before us, before our time. In fact, the negotiation phase of that was already in 2015 
when they when they negotiated with Mr. Bastos, and I think they ended up signing towards the end of 2016 for the for the deal. But uh, so to put your question into context, um, we we were not aware of a tender process other than the official communications of the Government Gazette. So and of course that we were number four on the on the final list. So we don't feel from our side that we had any preferential treatment uh, to be chosen by, by uh, Fish Corps. And, and this is also very important that the public and the readers realize that Fish Corps uh, came to solicit us. We were fine in Angola doing our business and in South Africa, but Fish Corps traveled to Angola and they came to solicit us to come and invest in Namibia to do the very same thing that we are doing in Angola. And this the reader, readers must understand. We don't own one freezer vessel in Angola. We only have RSW, fresh refrigerated seawater, cold, to bring all the fish we catch in Angola, we bring on shore. And that is why we have such a huge amount of workers. For us as AST, that's the sustainable route, to bring all the resources of the, the, the ocean to the shore and, and the, the money generated in that. Yes, there's a lower profit. We all understand that. But all of that money is a direct injection into the GDP of the country. Uh, the government has decided to cancel this, the sea, that uh, sea flower um, uh, partnership with your entity. Uh, it's, it's quite a, 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 a massive decision that I'm, I guess it has affected your business, but the cabinet claims that it was, a, it was in the interest of the public that it cancelled this partnership. Are you sour that the government has decided to divorce from your partnership? I need to clarify this point. We have had no correspondence from the government that, uh, on this matter. We've read in the newspapers about cabinet decisions, but we have not been informed by anybody. Um, Fish Corps has attempted to repudiate the agreement, uh, but we are disputing the repudiation uh, currently. The concept of divorce is also up for questioning. In terms of company law, such a divorce has to be legally managed and cannot be achieved by one party just walking away from a transaction. Business does not work like that. Um, I prefer the term corporate sabotage at present, but I remain hopeful that an amicable solution can be found. And to answer your question, I'm not sour, I'm just disappointed in the way that the government, through Fish Corps, has handled this matter so far, by keeping us absolutely in the dark. Uh, that is uh, my answer on this point. Since uh, you, have all, you have indicated that somehow government has indicated that they are going, they want to terminate this contract, even though indirectly and it's not according to what you prefer, what, what is now next for you as having, uh, you know, that entity, the, the sea flower pelagic entity, what, what, what now since the guaranteed quota that you're probably hoping for in the next 30 years will come through, what now? Are you going to walk away or are you going to now directly buy like other companies are buying quotas? Yes, look, um, firstly what we need to do is uh, we need to legally divorce fish corn. This is very important. And you know, in a business, you need the clever people, the, the lawyers and the advocates to present the facts. And then uh, we are not desirous to stay in this relationship. It's like a marriage, you know, when we all had marriages or relationships when we were younger. If, uh, if a relationship is sour or negative, there's no reason to stay in, the, in that relationship. We just want that um, when we divorce, that whatever happens up to that divorce, the horse and the cat and the dog and the children and the houses and the stuff, that needs to be dealt with. And that's what we want to do. The quotas that we that will become apparent later in our conversation today, the quotas that we did not receive in 2018, 19, and even this year, we need to bring these items all into account. And then from that moment, when we've divorced from them as a minority partner, we are going to continue our business as normal. The government will then be faced to decide, do they still want SPP, which of course most probably will have another name at the time, um, do they still want us to achieve the governmental objectives? Now the fact that we build a factory already ticks the biggest box. The reason for that is 
uh, other companies in the Namibian fishing industry has now followed suit and they've also built onshore factories. I think of a good example is Chunapot. They've built 11,000 tons, I think, facility. Uh, I believe um, that there's another company at the moment busy also building an onshore facility. So we have achieved, SBP has achieved that, uh, tick that box already, which coincides with the NDP-5. This is very important. A lot of people keep on forgetting about the NDP-5 program, which states that this must happen. And this is the reason, also one of the reasons why we bought into uh, investing in this country, because we realized that the government understands that the value, the value addition and the fish must come on shore. So to answer your question, you know, one must study um, your opponents sometimes and uh, we're not people that run away. I mean, we're here for the long haul. We're very proud of the factory that we've built. It's a world-class facility. I mean, people say it's the largest in sub-Saharan Africa. I've traveled Africa extensively and I haven't seen a factory this size. It freezes 600 tons a day. It's got a fish mill plant, state-of-the-art steam dried plant. It's got a very nice big cannery as well for extra value addition. So uh, we, may, we are here for the long run. So most probably we will, uh, we will continue to buy quota in the open market as the NDP-5 dictates, which we believe they should ample, be ample quota. But uh, like I said, the government will have to decide, um, do they still want us to employ 1,100 workers? or do we automate the factory? Because our biggest cost at this factory is the workers. So, uh, but that remains to be seen in the future. Okay, talking about uh, employment, uh, earlier this year, um, the partnership had indicated that you might retrench people because you don't have the quota. The government then, I think, realized that it might need to help, um, then it gave, a quota saying there is a promise that you keep jobs at least until December. That's what the government said. Now, all of a sudden, two less than two months, you announced that you are going to retrench workers. What happened then? Why did you did you mislead the government? No, not at all. Um, I just want to mention that last year was was our first startup year. The law of Namibia allows that when you start up a factory, massive one like this with lots of cost, uh, you can give the workers temporary contracts. From the day that we started, we indicated to the workers that on the 1st of July this year, we would go over to the phase of permanent workers. So in the beginning of the year, everything was still fine because we got a pro rata quota, which was not correct in terms of our contract, which we then uh, identified to the government. They came back, they said, no, it's an acting minister, he can only give a pro rata quota. It was def definitely a breach of contract with us, but we continued, we got 16,000 tons. Um, later in the year, again, we got another small portion of 5,000 tons, which was not in terms of our contract anymore, it was in terms of governmental objectives. And then very lately, we got 4,000 tons again. Um, this brings the total to 25,000 tons, which is precisely half of the quota that we are supposed to have. Um, for, for sure, from a business point of view, is you can't commit to uh, contracts with workers if you don't have any job for them. I mean, and that is the reality with us. If the government honored the 50,000 tons agreement, um, we would have employed the workers permanently on the 1st of July. All the unions are aware of it. Everybody knows, knows the story. So to answer your question, for the government to have claimed now to score some points uh, with the unions and the people, maybe in view of the, the elections, to say that here's 4,000 tons, uh, now you have to employ the people until the end of the year. What's going to happen after that? We as a business, we can't make those kind of decisions. We have to look and say we need to sweat 50,000 tons of fish through that facility minimum to have a small profit. I mean, so we were not in a position to, to, to give permanent contracts to workers. Currently, it was cold water now, our vessels are in, um, in maintenance. Uh, fishing was very bad, that's why we decided to, to put them in maintenance. So what will happen now is we have about 3,800 tons of fish left. Um, we will continue on the temporary basis, temporary worker basis until the end of the year.
hopefully there's some more features available. Currently we're negotiating with one or two role players that perceive some of the newcomers. But no, we, uh, we definitely uh, did not mislead anybody. We played open cards. Fishcore, the board that we had, and this is another point that the, the readers and the listeners must just understand. We've had um, three sets of directors in a year. <laughs> we, we, two of them is in car, incarcerated. Um, two of them made hardly any contribution because uh, the one gentleman was from the north and he didn't really understand the fishing industry. And uh, the current two directors was just on board for a month and then they, uh, they did not, uh, and we'll touch this later now with a court case, uh, they did not perform on their fiduciary duties and they realized that there's a, a, a problem, a conflict of interest, and that's why they resigned. So currently our business again is without the directors from, uh, from the fish force side or government side. One of the shareholders in this partnership uh, is called Africa Selection Trust Namibia. That's the company owned, right? Um, and that company is owned by Sellers Investments. Uh, this Sellers Investment is one of the companies that is accused of being used as a conduit to divert at least uh, 75 million that was meant for Fishco. Um, please explain to us why you are insisting that your partnership is not part of Fishrod, while Sellers Investment, which is, uh, has it links directly to, to Africa Selection Fish in Namibia, um, and is directly accused of being used as a conduit in this fish rod scandal. How do you explain to the public to say, this is the role of seller's investment, this is what your ownership is, and the fish rod scandal, without obviously um, divulging much that links to the court case. But at least, can you clear up that, or at least explain Anytime. Mm -hmm. um, just by virtue of you asking this very complicated question, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think the readers uh, out there even is more confused than ever. I'm going to try and explain it uh, very briefly. Um, we have the, fir the first vehicle we have, and the vehicle that we are talking about, and when I say vehicle, it's the business, called SPP. This is the factory uh, sitting in Balfish Bay. This factory has two partners. The one partner owns 40% and that is Fishcore. The other partner is AST Namibia, ASFN, which owns 60%. So you've got these two companies that owns SPP vehicle. When we go up to AST, when we came to Namibia, we uh, created our company, uh, we used our lawyer, uh, Mr. De Klerk, Marine De Klerk, was the lawyer of AST. It was not the lawyer given to us. In fact, Fishco wanted to use another firm, uh, but because we're the majority shareholder, we decided that we will use Mr. De Klerk. When AST was created, we decided, so AS, who is AST shareholders? When AST was created, the company, there was only two shareholders. The one shareholder is AST SA, which is the mother company of... of, of uh, of AST. The other shareholder, 95%, is in my name as a Namibian citizen. This was indicated to us by the government at the time that for Namibianization it's better that we rather carry the 95% share in a Namibian's name. Um, when we created the company, um, at the time, and I don't know if the readers can remember, every day in the newspapers was the law of NIF or this new law of NIF. In the time of 2016-17, people were talking about NIF on a daily basis, which is basically a BEE scheme. We understand the BEE scheme. We are in BE in South Africa, we have structures, we have BE structures in Angola. This is not uncommon territory for us. So we know how to set up a company. And the first step when you set up a BE scheme is you have to, on the first day, create a possible vehicle, which is called a NIF or BE vehicle, to carry some shares for previously disadvantaged people or communities going forward. And the reason that you do it on the first day, and I think it happened about a week after we created ASD, is that when you go to finance houses, bankers and internal finance, 
you can't at the later stage say that, sorry guys, we have to give away 25% or 20% of the shares now to somebody, because then you as investor have to stand par for it. So at the time, what happened is we discussed the near vehicle. It became very apparent that there would be a need to include previously disadvantaged people in the future. We had two rules as a board, as an ASD board. We said the first one is we want the NIF Act to be promulgated. This is very important because otherwise you can't do that. Like in South Africa, for instance. The second rule is that we had is we wanted a, a, a large part of the investment to come back to us. We've invested a lot of money in this project. There's a lot of risk. So we wanted this cash to come back before we start choosing people. So this was always something that we parked for the future. Mr. Marin de Clerc then went, bought a shelf company. The shelf company's name was Sidlux. And we issued him, out of AST, we issued him some shares with a clear instruction that you will find in our forensic report. That Mr. de Clerc, these shares must be held by you, as lawyers do, especially our own lawyer, keep this company and the shares in trust until such day that we will give you an instruction to where it would go and on what basis, which of course would be backed up by contracts because even BE shareholders have to pay eventually for their shares. So of course every year we have a lawyer on our board as well, our own lawyer, um, and uh, every year, Mr. De Klerk had to make declarations, which you will find in the forensic report, that this company and this vehicle is dormant, which means it doesn't have a bank account, and he keeps these shares. And this was in place, and he signed these documents every year, which you will find. So when eventually Mr. De Klerk indicated to us in early 2020, this year in January, that he's now, he wants to uh, resign from the board, of AST, um, we accepted his resignation. He quoted that he had some personal problems with a family member, uh, and as you will see in the instruction, the shares that he was holding in his own name in Silux immediately reverted back to AST. You understand? Mm -hmm. So where AST gave certain shares to a vehicle, when the clerk resigned, the shares came back to us. That doesn't mean that AST at any moment owned any shares in Silux. Silux as an entity today is a legal entity that will stand par and the clerk for whatever things that he did in that company. So Silux is no more in the, in the, in the books of AST. AST, maybe if you go to BIPA now, you will find that on the 1st of January this year, the shares came back and 100% of the share capital resides in AST, which is 5% AST uh, International and 95% in my name. So it's very disappointing. It's very sad, allegedly, what Mr. De Klerk has done. We have not seen any proof. I mean, I read in the newspaper, in your newspaper actually, that Mr. De Klerk has left the country. Uh, I was speaking to him on one or two occasions still in January and February before he left. I was not aware of, of, of these transactions at all. And in fact, two days still, we don't have any facts. We were, you know, we have not, any, anybody has any presented anything. But we believe allegedly that there has been transactions in CELUX, that Mr. De Klerk has an error um, applied for a bank account at some stage in the past and that he did put money through that account that came from different uh, uh, people or allegedly from Fishcore or whatever, but unfortunately we cannot quote on that. So I categorically want to state to the readers and listeners that AST Namibia was never directly involved and has not benefited one dollar in the whole fish rod scam. I, I want to state that very, very clearly. I think, uh, you know, as a Namibian, we have very competent uh, law enforcement agencies, and I've seen the AS ACC operates on a very good level, as well as the financial intelligence. And that's one of the reasons w why we did this uh, forensic report, where we opened up our books, and we gave this to everybody. We gave this to the ACC, we gave it to justice, to the 
ministries and nobody has ever come back to us on it. So uh, I hope this clears the point and clears the air. I know it's a very technical issue, but uh, you know, when you understand companies and company law, that you would realize that, uh, that the one has not, it's, a, it's got its own juridic personality, I almost want to say. And then, as I said, Mr. De Klerk and CELUX will have to face the full wrath of the law when, uh, when they come for him or, and for the company.